Dr. Navasky. He profiles several political cartoonists in his book, The Art of Controversy. That's next on C-SPAN 2's Book TV. Next, Scott Korb recounts the creation of the first four-year Muslim liberal arts college, Zaytuna College in Berkeley, California. This is about an hour and ten minutes. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I would first like to thank, uh, well, all of you for coming again. <laughs> I'd like to thank the NYU Bookstore um, and Yael for putting this together. Um, the event is also co-sponsored by the Islamic Center of NYU, um, and Khaled Latif is the head of that organization, so I'd like to thank him personally for, for being with us tonight. I teach at NYU. Uh, I'd like to thank all my students, any of you who are here. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, my colleagues, I teach in the Gallatin School of Individualized Study, uh, which is housed just across the street, and they were very supportive of my work, both as a professor um, as well as in writing this book, so I'd like to thank them as well. Um, my publisher is in Boston. Um, I'm happy to say that everyone involved with my publishing house, Beacon Press, is safe today. Um, and none of them can be here, of course, because they're in Boston, but I'd like to thank them as well. Um, especially my editor, uh, a fine editor named Amy Caldwell. I'd like to thank my agent, Jim. Um, a thrilling lord, literistic, and um, a few other people worth noting. Um, this book is about the first uh, Islamic liberal arts college, and the name of the school is Zaytuna College. And Zaytuna deserves um, a world of thanks for inviting me to look at what their school looked like in the first year. And that's what this book covers, is the first year of that school. And as you're about to learn, there was one student in particular, a student of mine, at NYU who had come from Zaytuna, who I think you'll see why I also owe um, a world of thanks to. His name is Ibad Rahman, and he is not here tonight. He's helping John Sexton, the president, uh, teach a class tonight. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank uh, my family. My mother's here. Thank you very much for being here. Um, and I, I'm ever indebted to my wife, Kate. Thank you. So I'll be reading a bit from the book, from the introduction of the book, and the, the section is entitled uh, Going Muslim, and you'll see why in just a moment. On November 9th, 2009, the journalist and magazine editor Tunku Varadarajan published an essay in Forbes responding to the mass shooting four days earlier by military psychiatrist Nadil Malik Hassan at the Army base in Fort Hood, Texas. While it would not be exactly fair to call Vardarajan a colleague, we've only ever corresponded, and that only very recently, that fall semester he was teaching a course at New York University's Stern School of Business, a stone's throw from where I teach writing about religion at NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study. Our proximity seemed reason enough to take his essay somewhat personally. So did the fact that we both drew paychecks from the same big account, though it wasn't just that. Certainly most of us can recall the terrible facts about Fort Hood. 30 people were injured and 13 people killed. Nearly all of the dead were military personnel. Various reports from the scene had Hassan, a Muslim, calling out Allahu Akbar before his rampage. Allahu Akbar means God is the greatest. In the years that followed, I hear this exclamation, known as the takbir, more times than I could report. Vardarajan's headline alone, Going Muslim, told the story he believed alarmingly too few Americans were willing to tell. Playing, of course, on the notion of going postal Vardarajan was attempting to coin this phrase as a way, in his words, to describe the turn of events where a seemingly integrated Muslim American discards his apparent integration into American society and elects to vindicate his religion in an act of messianic violence against his fellow Americans. The scenario, 
Enacting quintessential Islam, he has seemed to be saying, seemed even more dangerous than the threats of homegrown terror for being both unpredictable and inevitable. Things that grow, plants, molds, children, develop over time, usually in ways we can see. Going Muslim could happen in an instant, without fair warning. And what's worse, by Veradarajan's account, the fact that it wasn't happening every day seemed to go against the very nature of the Muslim, whose vindication in the contemporary West could only be earned by murder. Now these claims led to some controversy around school. Angry students and faculty, calls for disciplinary, ac disciplinary action against Veradarajan, and defenses of him on the grounds of academic freedom. The controversy was just a few days old before I heard any word of it, or had the chance to read the essay myself. I learned of it from a student, the quiet Muslim Ibadur Rahman, who sat most days at the far corner of the seminar table. He'd asked us to call him Ibad for short, and having stumbled both and having stumbled over both his given and family names while taking attendance that first day of class, I was grateful for that. Of course, it's stumbled over that line, right? Up to this point, he'd speak when called on. He'd very occasionally raise his hand with a thought to share. When he did, I would almost always ask him to speak up again or repeat what he'd been saying. In time, I would come to see his basic soft-spokenness as an expression of humility and de in deference more than anything else. This was part of his Islam. In 2004, after graduating from Stuyvesant High School, one of New York's premier public schools, Ibad had moved cross country to enroll in an experimental Islamic seminary program known at the time as the Javari School of Islamic Studies and run by an organization called Zaytuna Institute. Zaytuna had been founded in 1996 by the American convert Sheikh Hamza Yusuf Hansen and a partner as a nonprofit educational institute. By 1998, they had broken ground on a permanent Bay Area campus off a, busy F off a busy boulevard in Hayward, California. Individuals and whole families arrived by the score. The campus bustled in the evenings and all week during, and, all, and during the weekend all day. Hamza oversaw the construction of a yurt and the, insta in, in the installation of archery targets high in the trees. Archery was one of the Prophet Muhammad's favorite recreations, and the Muslim tries in all ways to model his life on the life of the Prophet. Living and studying with the scholars and the rest of the growing community at Zaytuna seemed to have made it clear to Ibad just how much they all knew, especially his teachers, and just how much he had to learn. I had never known a student to carry around so many books with him, each one just seemed one more piece of a puzzle that inshallah, if God wills, Ibad would say, might continue to reveal what a relevant Islam could look like in America. His assignments for me at first often looked more like pages to torn from Bartlett's familiar quotations than anything he might have properly called his own. You'll notice, and I realize he once wrote me, that I still have a number of long quotes that I need to work in better. Why well, try to say yourself what those before you have said with more knowledge, eloquence, and grace than you can muster? More even than Judaism, Islam places a premium on memorization and the verifiable transmission of wisdom across the generations. It started with Muhammad. Ibad was just doing his part. For my class, Ibad both wrote about and quoted at length the most relevant Muslims he knew, some of whom he had lived with and studied with on the Zaytuna campus in California. He told me how Sheikh Hamza, with the help of two other Muslim scholars, was just then transforming the seminary program into a liberal arts college. It turned out that Ibad's seminary program, which had some trappings of the typical Western education, was mainly the brainchild of Imam Zaid Shakir, a black convert originally from Berkeley, who, like Hamza, had studied overseas 
and returned with ambitions to make Islam indigenous to these United States. And yet, though the seminary was supposedly, quote, at the forefront of Zaytuna's goals as late as the spring of 2007, the founders and others close to Sheikh Hamza, with Shakir leading the way, were already planning what would result in a move away from Hayward's Zaytuna Institute and toward a permanent four-year college that they eventually hoped would earn accreditation. This had all become possible with the arrival in 2003 of Imam Zaid, who by Ibad's telling came across as the most relevant of all. So after four years in Hayward, Ibad returned to New York, and here at home, a few days after another Muslim, this one a member of the U.S. Army, had once again killed a number of Americans, a professor at his university seemed to be suggesting that his classmates and his teachers, including me, remain vigilant against the likes of him. Why? Because their religion, Veradarajan claimed, is founded on bellicose conquest, a contempt for infidels and an obligation for piety that is more extensive than in other schemes. In the few months I'd known him, Ibad had never seemed bellicose or full of contempt. His extensive piety revealed occasionally, say, in some reference to daily prayers or having studied at a seminary, something I'd also done, always seemed balanced with good humor and a kind of skepticism, especially where other people's piety ran afoul of relevance. And unlike the pious believers I've known from those religious traditions Vardarajan refers to as other schemes, Ibad wasn't the least bit judgmental, perhaps piously so. After all, according to, the, to a translation by Sheikh Hamza himself, tradition has it that the Prophet Jesus said, leave humanity alone and by doing give them repose from yourself. Always occupy yourself with good against the evil of yourself. Leave humanity, neither seeking their praise nor earning their censure. Concern yourself with what has been entrusted to you. In other words, Jesus says, mind your own business. The Muslims are supposed to listen. As a class, we'd only talk briefly about the Fort Hood killings the week after the shooting happened. But before class the next week, Ibad brought Vera Darajan's essay to my attention enforce the issue, albeit politely, my own schedule and lesson plan be damned. In class, we read the piece aloud, each student taking a paragraph before, before passing off the responsibility to the next one. Even I took a turn. It was strange having Veradarajan's words in my mouth. I'm not usually quite this paranoid. The difference between going postal in the conventional sense and going Muslim in the sense that I suggest, and these are Veradarajan's words, is that there would not necessarily be a psychological snapping point in the case of the, imminent, the imminently violent Muslim. Instead, there could be a calculated discarding of camouflage, the camouflage of integration in an act of revelatory catharsis. Though his rhetoric seemed more far-reaching than this, it seemed to reach into my classroom. In the end, the only practical bit of advice Veradarajan proposed was to the armed forces and involved mandatory reporting of suspicious remarks or behavior up the chain of command. Fortunately, the essay wasn't long enough to have Ibad take a turn. He just sat and took it in while his classmates told him how dangerous he was, a point of fact that since 9-11 was hardly news to him. The morning of 9-11, a 14-year-old Ibad was in Eric Grossman's second period European literature class when the principal of Stuyvesant High School came over the public address system with preliminary word of the attacks and instructions for the students to leave the school. At the end of Grossman's class, Ibad moved through the library on the sixth floor and looked down through the windows. He'd never seen the greenway along the Hudson River filled with so many people. Moving up the west side stairwell toward his drafting classroom on the 10th floor, before eventually being directed to gather with the other students in his homeroom on the 9th, Ibad had the same view again, those same people fleeing north from the burning buildings to the south. It was only minutes before Stuyvesant would begin to spill out onto the streets as well. Two girls Ibad knew from his homeroom 
Tarnima and Liana held hands as they moved along the Hudson. He was asked by another friend whether he was okay. Was anyone? Together they all walked for a while. Ibad's apartment is in the East Village, so it wasn't far from school. And at a point, he decided to peel off and find his way there alone. It didn't occur to him that his friends might like to accompany him, might like a place to get away from all of this. As he was in the habit of doing those days, while walking home across the city, Ibad listened to a recording of a recitation of the Quran by the Imam of the Prophet's Mosque in Medina. He was in the middle of memorizing the 12th chapter of the Quran on 9-11. By December or January, Ibad would have, would have the whole scripture memorized, an accomplishment that earns a Muslim the designation of Hafiz. I remember thinking, he since reflected, that people might see it strange that I was listening to my Walkman music while everything and everyone was in chaos. Of course, it might have been worse had those people known he was listening to the Quran. The evildoers could not be saved from our scourge. Their annals point to a moral point a moral to men of understanding. This is no invented tale, but a confirmation of previous scriptures, an explanation of all things, a guide and blessing to true believers, believers like Ibad. Soon after arriving home, Ibad left again for his local mosque. He took his bike, a simple choice that he would later recall while writing a farewell message to members of the Stuyvesant Muslim Student Associations in the days before his high school graduation. This is Ibad. Until recently, because of the chain, gears, and everything is messed up, he typed out, I've mostly gone to the masjid on bike. When it was time for the noon prayer on that day, I got on my bike and went. Unlike with his thinking about the recitation playing over his Walkman, Ibad didn't seem especially aware in the moment of how his ride to the mosque might have appeared to other New Yorkers still reeling in the hours after the towers fell. Writing in 2004 to his friends in the MSA, Ibad had a different perspective. People must have seen this as not nice at all. Me having a happy bike day 2001 when this had happened. Thoughts like these, awareness of being always on the defensive, feeling as though his very existence as a Muslim was displeasing to the world around him, were in large part what prompted Ibad to enroll in Zaytuna's pilot seminary program when he graduated from Stuyvesant. He was looking for ways to both ground himself more deeply in Islam, and though he may not have put it this way then, to present himself culturally as a faithful American Muslim. His success in this, sem his success in this at the seminary, would end up sending me to Zaytuna too. I needed to see where Abad had come from. It may be that the attacks carried out by so-called integrated Muslims in the years since 9-11 have made Tuku Vardarajan feel his warning was proper and properly put. What do you say in the face of an underwear bomber flying over Detroit? Or in the months just before Zaytuna opened, a smoking Nissan Pathfinder abandoned in Times Square and loaded with fireworks and propane tanks, gasoline, and 250 pounds of fertilizer. Here, in essence, is the problem I faced that day as we looked at Varadarajan's essay in my religion class, a problem that gets to the very heart of this book. Like many writers I know, I teach writing, and I tend as much as possible to teach what I know. It's no coincidence that this tendency in teaching mirrors the writer's maxim, write what you know. In the past, I've done this. My own background and religious training was in Christian theology, which over the years I've paired with a fair sampling of Judaism. I've studied Torah with a rabbi and wrote my first book with a moderately, a moderately religious Jew who taught me a great deal about the oldest of the three great monotheisms. While a student at Union Theological Seminary in the years before 9-11, I'd taken a required course on Islam but was preoccupied with most of the term, writing a novel I never published. One assignment I do remember had me responding to the rantings of a lunatic Muslim I'd never heard of before, Osama bin Laden. With the present book, 
which begins with the story of a Muslim in my own college classroom, and as you'll see, is essentially about what happens with Muslims in other college classrooms. I set out to write something I didn't know. It sounds absurd, but as late as 2009, I was attempting to teach students how to think deeply and write well about contemporary American religion without really being knowledgeable enough to do it myself. At the very least, I decided I could read Veradarajan's words aloud. Over the week that followed, I could agree in my gut with every criticism leveled against him. But when Ibad looked to me, and all eyes in the class seemed to follow him in this instance, to do my job as a professor of religion, I could do little more than stare blankly back. In effect, I was handing the class over to him. I can't help you, I seem to be saying. Explain yourself. Finding ways to explain himself is what set Ibad to Zaytuna Institute in the first place. Explaining themselves as traditional Muslim scholars is also what Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, Imam Zaid Shakir, and a third follow, founder, Dr. Hatem Bazian, have in mind in, with Zaytuna College, which after years of planning finally opened its doors for the fall semester 2010. Because as much as any of those involved in the story that follows would like to deny it, or like it not to be the case, there's no getting around the central place that the 9-11 terrorist attacks have in the way we, all of us, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, think about the place of Islam in contemporary America. We'd seen it once again at Fort Hood. What we'd been hearing in news report after news report for nearly a decade is that where Muslims gather in the public square, a local mosque, or a military base loaded with guns, Allah is in their midst, raising Cain. When Zaytuna College opened its doors, I was there. And I was there again and again and again throughout that first year in the classroom with Rashida and Fatima and Lina, Mahasan and Sumaya, most but not all of these women wearing hijabs. I was in the mosque with Dustin, listening to the sermons of Imam Zaid, in Islamic centers tucked away in low-rent industrial parks with Omar and his kids, in the dormitories in Zaytuna Library with Harun and Chris and Ahmad and Hadil, we ate together at halal restaurants and celebrated the birth of the Prophet almost every visit. Where Muslims gather, Allah is in their midst. This much I now know is true. And that is the introduction to the book. Thank you. Um, so, Imam Latif and I are now going to have some conversation about this book. <laughs> Ready? You know, firstly, I, I would say that um, having read through the book, I think it's, it's an amazing piece, and, and you did a, a, a great job with it. And I think in the introductory comments that you chose to share with the audience, it becomes really striking the narrative around Islam that we're used to hearing in the United States. You know, one that equates a normative understanding of Islam to be something that's inherently radical in its nature. Uh, but the story that you're sharing seems to be taking very substantive steps away from that idea. And I was hoping you could start off by just sharing with us, you know, what, what compelled you to, to share this story? You know, what, what was kind of the impetus of, of writing this in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, before I answer that, I should say that Ibad was actually here for about 90% of that, and then he sneaked out again. So <laughs> he sort of sneaked in and then sneaked out. The Muslims are always so sneaky. We are. Um, <laughs> 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 you fooled me. Um, I think I think what compelled me um, was, you know, I, I sort of hinted at it here in the in the book. Is I was just I felt like I had done very well with Christianity um, in my work in my writing, and I felt I had a good sense of what motivated Christians of various stripes. I certainly knew the, the stories that motivated Christians, and I knew the various ways that Christians um, were sort of operating in America. 
some I could find really compelling and I could agree with and for many years identify with, um, and to this day still identify with in certain ways. Um, Judaism, as I said, you know, I had done lots of work in Judaism and I felt Judaism as this sort of kindred faith tradition. Mm -hmm. And Islam, in my upbringing, had always seemed very foreign. Um, you know, I don't know that in my, the town I grew up in ever saw a Muslim. You know, that I certainly didn't, hadn't met a Muslim growing up that I knew of. Um, I could say the same thing maybe about a Jew, too. Um, and, and then here I was, and there was a student who just was in my classroom betraying all of, or not betraying, he was countering all of these popular notions. And it seemed to me that if I could get, if I could understand where he had come from, um, and understand who his teachers were, understand what it was about the tradition that he really valued and what it was that he saw that was different from um, the Muslims who have been stereotyped and what, what, what I've been told that Muslims had seen, you know, that, that living in America was, um, was necessarily by its very nature difficult, um, that integration um, was impossible, uh, that all of those stereotypes about the, the violence, the extremism, mm -hmm. um, if I could find that and be able to write about it in a narrative way, which this book tries to do, is sort of cover this, the course of this year and tell stories about individuals who, you know, who weren't only Ibad, but who were like Ibad and who represented, you know, in some cases kids, you know, 18, 19 years old, in some cases 30, 35 year olds, who all really, you know, want to make it clear that their lives are here in America. And Ibad seemed to be saying that to me, but I hadn't found other places where that, I hadn't found other examples of that, but it was my fault, like I really hadn't paid attention, I hadn't been looking for it, I hadn't been, you know, really processing it. It's not to say that those examples weren't around, I just mm. didn't know, I, who, I didn't know who Sheikh Hamza was, I didn't know who Imam Zaid was, he brought them into my class, and, not, per, not literally, he brought their <laughs> ideas into my class, and I was like, all right, now, now we have, you know, religious leaders who I think need to be more well known, and, so part of, the, part of the hope for this book is to say, you know, here are the students who are like Ibad, who have committed themselves to um, learning Islam with these teachers, and these teachers should be better known, and these are their ideas, and, you know, away we go. That's, but it was, I mean, it, it started to me as a kind of ignorance. Mm. Um, but, but an ignorance that, that's, that I felt in my gut was wrong. You know, not an ignorance that would lead me to say something that was ignorant, but an ignorance that said, I need to sort of figure this out. Yeah, yeah. And I sort of beca I began, I mean, I began sympathetically, um, and I think sympathy is a real part of the book as well. Sympathy for the misunderstanding, mm. or what I assumed was a misunderstanding, what I learned is a misunderstanding. I mean, Ibad seems to have, and we, we can talk about him a lot since he's gone now, but... <laughs> Um, he, you know, he, he definitely seems to play a very critical role, at least initially, in the impetus for going out to Zaytuna. And having spent the amount of time that you did at Zaytuna and with Hamza Yusuf and Zayd Shakir and understanding their pedagogy and what they're hoping to achieve and establish, you know, do you feel as if Ibad, uh, in your class, after four years at this pilot program at Zaytuna, is really the product that they're they're hoping to shape. Mm -hmm. Ibad has this quality, and I refer to it a little bit in, in the, the introduction where I refer to his always carrying this bag full of books, you know. Um, but one thing I think that he took away, and one thing I think that this, the scholars are trying to instill in the students at this school which is still small, it's a small liberal arts college, um, is that all knowledge is sacred knowledge. And that you don't have to be studying the Quran all the time to be understanding that sacred knowledge. You don't have to be studying the Hadith all the time or the sayings or, or the tradition of the Prophet all the time to be getting sacred knowledge. Mm -hmm. You can read Ernest Hemingway as Ibad does in this class with John Sexton, or you can think and talk about baseball as he does in that class. Or when I was recently out at 
um, at Zaytuna sort of just in recent weeks uh, in preparation for the book to come out. Um, in, the, in a logic classroom, they were reading Shakespeare sonnets. Um, I, didn't, I can explain why I think they were reading Shakespeare sonnets, but in a logic class. But, um, you know, and they were reading Robert Frost. And if you hear Sheikh Hamza ever give a talk, and he gives these amazing lectures um, and sermons, if you ever hear him give a talk, you'll hear him refer to Dante, or you'll hear him refer to um, Bob Dylan. You know, he's, he loves Bob Dylan, loves Robert Frost, loves Emily Dickinson. Um, that the tradition, the religious tradition, comes into play with these American cultural uh, pieces or European cultural pieces, um, English you know, cultural pieces. And I think that Ibad has done that in his, I mean, in his four years, he's graduating in the, in, in the, the, in the spring. He represents that, and if that is what Zaytuna does, is create students who aren't only interested in Islam, for whom Islam is maybe the very center of their life, mm. um, but who also have these other varied interests that will allow them to go out and do other varied things, that's what um, the Zaytuna, Zaytuna College is, is preparing, and he, he does that as a student. Um, but Ibad will probably, you know, if I know him well enough, and I've written his, app, his uh, not his applications, I've written his <laughs> recommendations. Um, you know, he wants to go on and be a scholar, you know. Um, but not everyone at Zaytuna will go on and be an Islamic scholar or a scholar of Islamic studies. You know, one of the things that Zaytuna talks about in their promotional material now is that every lawyer has a soul, you know, and, and every doctor has a a heart. Mm. Um, and that's another thing that I find really compelling about schools. They're not, I, and this may be because it is established as a, as a religious institution, is they're not afraid to talk about the soul and they're not afraid to talk about the heart. Mm. And what Ibad has brought into NYU, and it's I think sometimes struggle with, and my interest in talking about the soul and my own interest in talking about the heart has sort of oftentimes created a little bit of tension for me even. Um, is that he's brought that to his classrooms, and he said, "Look, this is important." And mm -hmm. I think you know, being able to talk about that in a class in a class with John Sexton, where he's doing baseball as a road to God, um, at the center of that class is this this search. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is what Zaytuna was trying to create in their students, not a bunch of imams, although there may be some. Um, so they're not trying to create you, you know. <laughs> but, um, Nobody wants to be like that. Okay. Um, I, I can deal with it. <laughs> you know, they're they're trying to educate students who will take their education and go do more with it um, beyond only studying Islam. Although they should walk out of there feeling like morally centered people and um, people who understand that everything they do is in the service of God. And I think that that's something that Ibad feels, and I think that that's something that all of the students there feel. Yeah. You know, and we may not all feel that way, but there are lots of people in this world who do, and mm. the students as they tune to do. Yeah, I, think, I think something you said that was really interesting was uh, going into a class on logic, and they're teaching Shakespeare's sonnets, yeah. or they're reading Robert Frost, and you know, no one would have an expectation that in our own preconceived ideas and stereotypes around what Muslims are, and then in turn what Muslims would be, must be teaching to, to others, that you would find place for Shakespeare, or you would find place for Frost. And you know, I think it'd be, it'd be interesting to hear, um, you know, what kind of ideas did you have going into Zaytuna, and how are those ideas either reinforced and affirmed, or how do they differ from what you actually experienced when you were on the ground, uh, essentially just in this Muslim community? Mm -hmm. I think I, at first, I wasn't expecting, I feel like I'm ignoring the side of the room a little bit because of the microphone, sorry. Um, I feel like I wasn't expecting uh, to be quite as welcomed at first. And this doesn't have anything to do with theology or, um, or Islam necessarily. Um, when I went out there the first time, in August of 2010, 
this was at the height of the Park 51 controversy, when the reports about Islam were, um, well, the loudest reports about Islam were largely negative. And I think Zaytuna, as an institution, w had their guard up a little bit. Um, so NPR went out there and did a story, um, and uh, who else went out? And there were any number of, I think CNN did a story. <coughs> and those stories, you know, reported um, a little bit, but, you know, they got a, a glimpse into a classroom, um, you know, or they got a shot or a s brief interview with one of the students. Um, but I didn't think it, I didn't think they were really getting the whole story. And so when I went out there, I sort of, knowing that there was this media coverage, um, I sort of sat back a little bit and w waited to approach certain things, like waited to approach the classroom. But what I found was, and this I think was the surprise at first, was that the students, without question, wanted their stories to be told. They're like, come meet with us. There was a woman named Lena Safi who I, I write about a lot in the book. Um, she said, you know, I don't know who you are. I got a Facebook message from her. She said, I don't know who you are, but I hear you want to write about Zaytuna. I'm going to set up a meeting with 10 of the students, and you're going to gather in, my, in our dorm room, and we're going to have tea, and it's going to be great. And that was just perfectly welcome. You know, and, and they didn't really know me from Adam. I wouldn't want someone bursting into my house and writing about my life. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. but what we have here is this group of students who were told at the convocation of the school that they were doing something historic, and they weren't shying away from that. And Lena's, she was 18, mm. you know, and she was putting herself out there to say, "Look, I'm a Muslim American. I'm very content with who I am as a Muslim American in certain ways, and I have a lot to learn. And you want to write about my progress in learning that? Great. Here's some of my friends too. You know, come and come and." Let us show you what it is that we care about. Let us show you why we love Sheikh Hamza. Let us show you why we love Imam Zaid. Um, that was a bit of a surprise to me. It was just how open and welcoming they were. Now, Ibad helped a lot, I have to say. He made some introductions, which I think were really essential. And the other thing that I can say that was really surprising was the level of emotion that I found. Not just, um, you know, I grew up Catholic, and there was very little emotionalism in my services. Um, I don't remember my priest being particularly emotional or even much about being Catholic to be very emotional at all. And I certainly didn't like love my priest, mm -hmm. you know? You know, I liked him, but I didn't, I didn't love him. Mm -hmm. I admired him, but I didn't like admire him. I didn't want to be like him except for a very brief moment in my life when I thought I wanted to be a priest, but side story. Um, but these <laughs> students, love their teachers in ways that, um, you know, there's a risk in that of, of not being able to question their teachers. And I think um, that's something that Zaytun will probably have to struggle with over time, is how do we develop an appreciation and admiration for the, the faculty without it being about emotion entirely. But I think that that emotion in the classroom um, does a lot for their feeling uh, of comfort, and f it does a lot for their spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that it reflects is the scholar's love and the student's love of the prophet, which is what I, another thing I wasn't expecting. I don't often see um, people crying, tearing up about their love of Jesus. Now, I know it happens, but not in the communities that I was raised. Um, and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, who is arguably the most influential Muslim scholar in the West. I mean, he's been called that by the Muslim 500, which is a, a ranking, you know, I, by published, et cetera. But in any event, he's incredibly influential. And the man gets up on stage, and he talks about the prophet, and he weeps. I mean, he, he feels it, and, he, and that is super compelling to these students. Um, and it was super compelling to me, and I, you know, don't feel that way about the prophet, mm. you know, but he, he, he that was, it's just, it surprised me. Yeah. It's something I, I write about in the book, too, yeah. Yeah. One of the more interesting uh, scenes in the book comes around Easter time, where 
the students at Zaytuna reached out to you and asked um, if they could attend Easter services with you. And, and I thought, why I thought it was interesting was, you know, you spent all this time with them kind of observing and understanding their faith and their identity and uh, how one kind of fits into the other. Um, and they've essentially now turned it back on you mm-hmm. and said, we want to come and, and see what it's like to, to be part of this service. Um, yeah. how, how was that? Well, it was funny. Um, I had spent um, Good Friday, as it's known among Christians, with this group of students um, in what's called a molid, which is a celebration of the birthday of the prophet. And it's a controversial practice in Islam um, because if, and you'll correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but the, the idea is that if the prophet himself wasn't uh, doing something, then for us to do it, for Muslims to do it in the future, would be uh, contrary to the model of the prophet. Around worship. Around worship. Celebratory, yeah. So to worship the prophet, or to to celebrate the prophet's birthday um, is controversial, but at Zaytuna they love it. And um, we had done that on Friday night, and then Saturday I took a day off, I was probably grading papers or something like that, Um, and I got text messages from Lena, um, asking me very politely if she could go to church with me the next day, Easter Sunday. Now, I was not, at this time in my life, a churchgoer. (laughs) But I did, to them, represent the knowledge of Christianity. And I don't don't know that I ever, I don't think it was ever as direct to say, like, I don't go to church. You know, I'm I'm not that kind of Christian. Um, But she assumed that I did, and the group assumed that I did. And so we sent a flurry of text messages back and forth, which is often how we communicated, um, to sort of set up meetings and interviews. And, you know, emoticons and the whole bit. Um, <laughs> and usually from them, I'm not very emoticon y, but. Um, and I said, of course. Like, of, yeah, of course I will. And the idea was that they had, they, yeah, again, I think, I think you're getting it exactly right. Like, they had been sort of telling me over and over what they were about. And they wanted to know a little bit more about what I was about. So I found a church in Berkeley that I thought was, would be good, and we went, and I walked the women up the pew. It was a group of women. Um, none of the men had decided to come. So I walked this group of women up the front. None of them had ever been to a church service before, and I sneak into the pew ahead of them, and I explain to them what's going to happen. There's going to be standing and sitting and kneeling and singing and... Um, and these are all the things that in the mosque, when I visited mosques, I would be instructed to, I would be instructed about as well. You know, put your hands this way. And um, I had an older man uh, at the first mosque I went into tell me in what order I should take my shoes off before I um, enter the mosque. And so the, they're getting ready for the service to begin. And Fatima looks over at me and looks over at the other women. And she sort of points ahead at the, at the front of by the altar and she says she says to us look Mary's in hijab and I was like that is it you're look like that's it you're looking for it like that's that's what they were there for yeah. they were looking to connect and in Mary they did now Muslims already honor Mary um, she's the only woman mentioned by name in the Quran known as the mother of the prophet Jesus um, so they identify with her already but to identify in that way to be in the church and to say look, there she is, and she's like us in this way, um, was pretty profound. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a little punchline. I don't know if she planned it, but it was really good. I mean, it, she, she saw it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So you, you said you went out there a few weeks ago in anticipation of the yeah. book launch. I mean, yeah. what's going on at Zaytuna now? Yeah, and maybe um, I'll sort of talk a little bit about this and then do just another short bit of reading and then sure. um, take a few questions and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the past couple of years, so Zaytuna's been around since 2010, and um, they have sort of had their ups and downs. One of the downs was um, in trying to figure out how to train people in Arabic with the speed that they need to um, in order to graduate them all with Arabic uh, proficiency. They, don't, they have a certain amount of Arabic that they need to come in with. Um, so that's one of the struggles they've had. Um, but what they've done is, originally they had uh, decided to do two majors. One, 
that would be Islamic law and theology, and the other would be Arabic. And they've decided just in January to make a switch to make the foundation for the, the school simply the liberal arts. Um, and they think of them in sort of the, the style of the Renaissance of the quadrivium and the trivium. Um, and I won't be able to name them all, but um, astronomy, music, ar arithmetic, et cetera, et cetera, Re logic, rhetoric. Um, and that now is the foundation. And they still emphasize Islamic law and they still emphasize theology, but, um, but really what they're about is doing a liberal arts curriculum. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's why you find Shakespeare and Yeats and Dickinson in this logic class. Now, I don't know that it's a perfect mesh. I don't know that it's working perfectly yet. Um, but they're trying to not only do the, this liberal arts cur curriculum, but also trying to integrate their classes so that what they, what they graduate with is not a degree in liberal arts. Well, I'm sorry. What they, gra they won't graduate with a degree in Arabic or Islamic law and theology they have a liberal arts degree from Zaytuna College. It's the degree that the institution grants. Mm -hmm. And that's been sort of the major change um, in the past uh, year in terms of curriculum. Now, the other thing I can say is they had been renting classrooms from the American Baptist Seminary in the West, of the West, um, which is a night school. It's a seminary, but it's a night school. So they were, having, they were occupying the rooms in the basement of that place. Um, and they very recently purchased uh, a new campus up on top of what's called Holy Hill in Berkeley. So they're now amidst all the other uh, seminaries mm. um, up there, which is the hope is that they have a permanent campus which allows them to sort of feel more permanent. And they can, uh, one of the founders has called it the, the address for Islam in America. Um, and they're very proud of that move. Um, and they're very excited about it. They should graduate the next class, or the, I'm sorry, they should graduate the first class, which will be graduating next year from that, from that building. Um, so, you know, they make steps forward and then they have a step back and they make a few forward and a step back. And um, yeah, I mean, their, their spirits are up right now. Mm. Um, they're optimistic that it will be a successful project. And um, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I'm sympathetic and I wish them well. You know, I hope that they, they can be. Um, let's see. Can we check the time? I just want to know where we are. About seven. Okay. Um, I think I'll read for just a few more minutes, and then I'll take. We'll take questions. Both of us are more than happy to do that, and then, um, and then we'll be done. Okay. <laughs> So this is just a short passage from, this is a short passage about a trip I took to the mosque. Um, not my first trip, but. So we were taking a bus from Berkeley to a storefront mosque in Oakland called the Lighthouse Mosque, where Imam Zaid very often uh, will give his sermons. There was as much prayer and reading on the bus as there was talking. They took turns, moving from bright conversation to silent reflection. But Fatima especially was absorbed in the pocket Quran she carried with her and used, it seemed, to prepare for Juma. Juma is the Friday prayer. She also had taken to heart a lesson from the new Islamic law professor, an old-time Zaytuni, Sheikh Yahya Rodas, who told them, always carry a little notebook with you. Whatever inspires you or rings true for you, he said, was meant for you. Whatever inspires you. So make sure you write it down. Faced with what Fatima called the obvious way that Zaytuna classroom, or really any classroom, was not like the rest of the world, and vice versa, every moment deserved the attention of a note taker. Though the Zaytuna classroom might be structured with the books and schedules and tests that are the trappings of any classroom, what's out there, what's out here, she said, is no less important. Structured as it is, she said, so much more obviously by the divine. The whole world is the classroom. She saw in it signs and proofs of Allah. Our ride to the masjid lasted some 20 minutes. They were only a few weeks back into the routine of dorm living and classes. This is after winter break. And reports were that things around campus felt both different and the same. 
The most striking differences was certainly the loss from classes of Abdul Jalil, Naima, and Dustin. Although in Dustin's case, he'd stuck around the Bay to continue his Islamic studies degree at UC Berkeley and to continue his courtship of Allah. Allah, sorry. He'd, move out, he'd moved out of the men's dorm, though, and was around less. Lena was thrilled to be back in the Bay, which had felt like a kind of homecoming. Of course, I had to leave the women when we entered the mosque. Spotting Ali, I stepped in and made my way to kneel beside him. The mosque was packed, and before Imam Zaid could really get going with his sermon after the call to prayer, he asked the men in the front to make some more space for the women, who, though in the same room, sat several rows across the back wall. Brothers, can you come forward? Pack in, pack in tight. You'll find mercy, inshallah, said Zaid. A natural path usually formed across the room, but given the numbers today, that was disappearing. And unable to pack in any tighter, it quickly became clear that some of us, Ali and I included, were not long for the mosque. The weather was beautiful, and Ali and I marched out in our stocking feet with a number of other men to take our places on the sidewalk. At the door, some of the brothers laid a tarp over the concrete. Behind that, Ali spread out his jacket. We kneeled again on that. As was usual, Imam Zaid spoke into a microphone, and today his message carried out into the street. Zaid's sermon had opened in what he considered, under the circumstances, he said, in an unusual way, with a letter addressed to God by a 12-year-old Pennsylvania girl whose father had been killed in the West Virginia Sago mine explosion in 2006. Originally published in USA Today, the letter's closing lines represented Zaid's model of faith in times of calamity. I love you, God, it said, and I have never forgot that you are still in charge. I do understand why you did what you did. I love you, Daddy, and God, amen. That was a story Imam Zaid often told. Yet it's true, under the circumstances, it hardly made sense to start this way. Here were those circumstances. Since January 25th, just more than two weeks earlier, Egypt had been in revolt. That day and for weeks to follow, Tahrir Square would be filled with revolutionaries. And just this morning it was announced that the dictator Hosni Mubarak had essentially been deposed. Still, whatever success the revolutionaries achieved against the Mubarak regi regime did not come easy. And, said Zaid, had been possible only because they'd responded to the message of the prophet. Respond with... Which, Respond with that which is best. And you think you've got it hard, he seemed to be saying. Zaid does not doubt or minimize the, quote, many hazards American Muslims face as they continue to, quote, negotiate the future in the United States. But, Zaid continued, those negotiations have not yet involved facing down hired thugs armed with submachine guns and lances, or those goons, he said, charging horses and camels into a crowd those young Egyptians would not be turned back. By holding on to the principle of unity, holding on to the principle of nonviolence, they concluded, they've been blessed to see the hold of the dictator released from them. And then he pressed on. Even from outside the mosque, you could feel a rising intensity. And Zaid brought his story of revolution back home, back to America, back to North Oakland, back to the storefront mosque spilling its congregation out onto Martin Luther King Jr. way. So many Muslims, he knows, he said, are tempted to turn back just because people are talking about them, just because people are looking at them funny, just because people are whispering when they walk by. And with a whisper, he growled, it's getting tense in America. Then he played a character the complaining and put upon American Muslim. They're talking about us. They're looking at us funny. Maybe I should abandon Islam. Maybe I should stop going to the masjid. Maybe I should take my hijab off. Maybe I should, have my, maybe I should shave my beard. Maybe I should stop wearing my kufi. Maybe I should just, he paused, drift away. Because with Zaid, the times do not call for assimilation or the Muslim stillness that Sheikh Hamza had spoken about. Today, and today was a significant and symbolic day, he said, those drifters should find their inspiration in the history being made in North Africa. He concluded, 
but people of Egypt are showing that history isn't made by people who back down in the face of a challenge. History isn't made by people willing to compromise their heartfelt belief. History is not made by people willing to turn back at the first sign of trouble. Zaid's mosque was filled with young people. What Ali had said at the doorway of Zaytuna's library seemed especially true for the Bay Area Muslims under 30. He told me, it's Zaid, you gotta go, right? And today he'd made his entreaty for these local Muslims to make the kind of history that Egyptian revolutionaries had only just begun to forge in what would come to be called the Arab Spring. So thank you all. Um, we have time for a few questions. Um, again, they can be either for me or Imam Latif. Um, we're happy to have a little bit more conversation. Um, I just ask that before you talk, just wait for the microphone. Thanks. Any, <coughs> anything? Um, so when you went to Zaytuna, I'm curious if you got any sense of um, anything specific they were looking for um, in hiring a brand new set of faculty. Um, so for all the faculty teaching at Zaytuna, especially with it being brand new, was there anything, any trends that you noticed in who they hired? Um, th the school has been largely staffed by people who have been around Zaytuna for years. And they've, well, one hire that they made in the, in the administrative level, at the administrative ranks, was uh, a guy called Omar Nawaz, who's no longer there. Um, and he used to work in technology, um, and he had the management skills that they wanted. So there, there is that struggle of, there and I think Omar sort of represented that. You have all of these guys who have, um, in in many cases, studied overseas, don't have, don't necessarily have the administrative chops to put together a, a liberal arts college, um, but do have the scholarship. So I think that that, that was probably in terms of hiring their mo their, their most difficult challenge um, was to find who would actually carry out the running of the the school and Omar did a really wonderful job um, and they have he's been replaced um, by uh, a man who I haven't yet met so I'm not sure but um, but seems to be filling that that role well um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you're saying about the role of sympathy in both getting these students and the people you're talking to to open up and having kind of access to these stories and then how that translated into you, you telling their stories. Mm -hmm. um, I think, so in going out, I should say, Ibad met me in California on my first reporting trip. And he was teaching there in, the, in an Arabic intensive program that they have in the summers. And he made various introductions which, su which suggested to them, the school, that I was a sympathetic, um, that, I had a sim that I had some sympathy for their, their cause, for what they were trying to do. Um, and there was some talk in those early days about um, what Fox News had said about them. So they knew what sort of the unsympathetic views were. And they thought, my sense is, and Ibad's introduction, I think, emphasized this, was that here was someone who had some sympathy. Um, and wanted to tell a story. And, you know, I think we, we were able to develop it in, look, I'm not, I should say this, I'm not a trained journalist. I haven't gone to journalism school. Um, so there was part of this book that was not only learning about Islam, but learning about how to get, get people's stories from them and then how to tell them. And so I found opportunities, and I think Lena was, um, I think I mentioned the way she sort of helped me set this up was just to find ways to sit around for hours at a time and just talk with each other and say, why are you here? And they would say, well, 
I really wanted to study with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. He's been an inspiration to me. I've seen him at this conference and this conference, and my mom thought it would be great. And there were so many interesting stories about how mothers sent their sons and daughters to Zaytuna. It's really remarkable. It's something I remarked on the last time I was out there. Um, and so my, what I was able to, what I learned, I think, is just that if you spend a good amount of time with people and you offer, and you, I guess, offer a little bit of yourself as well, but just give them time to, to tell you what they want to tell you. Um, and don't cut them off and don't try to tell them what they want to tell you, which is easy when you don't really know what it's like to attend a mosque. So when I said, what was it like at home? They sort of told me what mosques were like because I maybe hadn't been in one yet. Um, and, and then they told me about, well, why their mosques at home weren't so great in some instances, and why they found Zaytuna much more welcoming. And they were, able, they were able to narrate some of that to me. And then that seemed like the story to tell in those moments of the book. So when I was talking about the mosque, and I had collected you know, 10 stories about these students' experiences back home, um, whether that's in Brooklyn or whether that was in, you know, Denver or Miami, Orlando, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, you know, I got a really good sampling of, of, you know, where these people had come from and what was bringing them here. Um, and I think we developed sympathy among each other just in a way by my showing up and my listening and my talking. And then in the end, you know, my taking them places, you know? which was um, great and appears in the book and you know, there's follow-up. I mean, is that what you mean by sympathy? Yeah. I love how um, you began this and ended this with um, kind of marking moments in people's perception of Muslims, especially in the United States, by uh, events in history. Uh, and and I wonder now, in the wake of the uh, Boston Marathon incident and the um, kind of speculation about uh, the causes and the debates that have been happening in the media, uh, I wonder if either of you have some reflections on on what that says about where we stand in this country, uh, uh, where Muslims stand in this country, and the challenges that confront uh, Zaytuna today. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just say a few things, and then maybe you. No, go ahead, um, I was a lot of um, how I stay in touch with either the the community at Zaytuna or the people around Zaytuna. There are lots of leaders now who have gone through Zaytuna in certain ways and been trained by Imam Zaid and Sheikh Hamza, um, and sort of come out and now lead do their own, are their own leaders in their own right. Um, I follow one leader in particular called, um, his name is Imam Suhaib Webb. Um, he was recently on uh, Face the Nation, um, the CBS morning show, representing Islam um, in a roundtable discussion about religion in America. And on the one hand, every major Muslim organization in the country um, did issue some statement about Boston that I could tell. I think, I, I mean, I read that today. Um, Imam Suhaib was not I mean, among them. And he is in Boston, and he has the largest, he leads the largest Islamic community in Boston. Um, and his commitment that he made, that he, a commitment as well as a challenge that he made today on Twitter was come and run the marathon with me next year. That will be the, our sort of, our sign, um, our show of solidarity. Um, so on the one hand, I mean, Zaytuna issued a statement, Imam Zaid issued a statement today. Um, there's this demand that m Muslim organizations always issue statements on, on days like today and days like yesterday. Um, but it's a demand that Muslim institutions in this country, so far as I can tell, are, have risen to, whether those are just expectations or not. Um, and then to take it up a notch, what, what Imam Suhaib was doing today was to say, I'm not just going to issue a statement, but I'm going to like, firmly plant myself in Boston again and say, this is where I live. 
Um, and this is where I lead my community. And I'm going to call on people from around the country to come with me. And next year, you know, act in solidarity this way. I thought that was a moving tribute. Um, yeah. Do you have some thoughts about this? Yeah. You know, I, I think... I think it's the, the issue that's being dealt with is essentially in a, a very stark otherizing of the Muslim population um, and a racialization of the faith, right? The, the idea is such that Islam is something that's from 500 miles away or from 500 years yeah. in the past, um, and it's not something that can be, uh, you know, American, so to speak. And to answer your question, I would say what yesterday does um, for Zaytuna in my opinion, is just reinforce the importance of a Zaytuna, where the idea is to establish authoritative figures um, that can go out and from within the Muslim community, not just craft, but also tell a narrative um, that starts to combat that kind of stereotyping, right? Where the idea isn't one that says you're innocent until proven guilty, but kind of the contra to it, you're suspect, um, unless you can tell us you actually deserve to be here. Uh, and being able to engage these young men and women who are coming from a variety of ethnic and cultural backgrounds and empower them to go out and be the ones who are sharing this narrative to segments of society that I think are really looking for answers to questions um, that unfortunately uh, those who don't always have the best interest of Islam are the ones that are out there answering right now. Um, so I would say Zaytuna, uh, in my perspective, is that much more important um, in trying to deal with some of that, right? Because, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm displaying my ignorance, but uh, the issues from yesterday are, are just kind of suspicions. It's not even concrete as to who has done it, but the natural inclination, and depending on what news channel you're watching, if you're watching CNN, it's, you know, officers are with a gentleman in the hospital who's of an Arab background. And if you're watching Fox News, it's um, officials have uh, caught a potential suspect who's a Saudi national, right? And the story is being told to the audience that's receiving it, um, but it's just perpetuating it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, should we, any, maybe one more question if there is one? Yeah, I just, I wanted to ask, um, this is the this is the first college, uh, the first Muslim college in, in America. Are there more? I mean, are there are there people who are who are kind of taking this as a as a beacon and, and moving forward with that? I think um, there's another institution that calls themselves an Islamic college, but they don't have the. Um, and this is in Chicago, and Zaytun actually has cooperative relationship with them, the American Islamic College. Yeah. Um, but they don't have. The, um, the, the, process, the same process of matriculation. People take classes one semester and maybe don't take classes the next semester, and it's sort of a pay-per-class rather than a pay-for-year tuition for the year. And Zaytuna operates on a tuition, go there, graduate. You know, We're going to move you through. Um, and that, that Islamic college doesn't work like that. There are all kinds of other um, educational institutes, um, some related to Zaytuna, some not related to Zaytuna, some which have a different message than Zaytuna does. Um, and they're sort of all negotiating, you know, among themselves. Uh, well, I, I think they're just negotiating between themselves. There's not sort of an end in that. They're just, you know, you know, people sort of sometimes dance around each other and aren't quite exactly sure how to interact with each other. I think there's some bit of that, um, maybe even a little bit of nervousness or anxiety about who's going to, um, be on the fore of Muslim education in this country, and is it going to be, you know, this this kind of Islam or this kind of Islam? Um, and but there are other there are other people th doing educational initiatives, and Zaytuna has plans. Now they they don't have anything on paper in in this in this planning and at that level. But I had a conversation with Imam Zaid that he said that if they were going to expand Zaytuna, it probably wouldn't be uh, in Berkeley. They might have branches of it around the country. And again, this was, you know, he didn't tell me this off the record or anything, but he didn't say it with any conviction that this is definitely happening. Um, you know, so we're sort of thinking way in the future. And the other idea that they have in terms of education is not to reach 
forward in age, but rather to reach backwards, um, to reach younger kids and establish um, Islamic high schools or esta establish relationships with Islamic high schools. And there's lots of those around, um, around the country. Yeah. Um, well, I am um, so grateful for all of you to be here and to ask me and Imam <laughs> Latif these questions and to listen uh, to the reading. Um, I will be sticking around um, to uh, sign some books if you would like. Um, and anyone who would care to may join at an establishment called the Dove Parlor, which is on <laughs> Thompson Street between 3rd and Bleecker, and we'll be there shortly. All right? So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Is there a nonfiction author or book you'd like to see featured on Book TV? Send us an email at booktv at cspan.org or tweet us at twitter.com slash booktv.